everyone, and welcome to the second Ontologist Cup session of the convention. I'm Celine Ober, and I will facilitate the session. Today, we'll learn more about Agrimetrics, a data marketplace for the agri-food sector and how the platform uses ontologies. Richard Tiffin, Chief Scientific Officer at Agrimetrics, will introduce how the platform enables organizations to safely share and monetize the data while making it easier for data consumers to access the information they need. Monica Solenki, Principal Data Scientist at Agrimetrics, will explain how controlled vocabularies and ontologies are used to support their linked open data platform. After their presentations, we'll have a Q&A session where you will be able to interact with them. So please send your question during the presentations and we'll take them at the end. I will now leave the floor to Richard Tiffin. Thank you, Celine, for the introduction and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present Agrimetrics today. Hello, everyone. Agrimetrics is a company set up in the UK in part funded by, by UK government, but with uh, an expectation that we will be uh, self-sustaining uh, eventually. Uh, the premise for establishing the company is that there is a wealth of data available in the agri-food sector, um, but at present it's, it's, it, it's not being made accessible uh, to the extent that it, it could be. So uh, we want to encourage data sharing to start taking place within the sector, but very importantly we acknowledge that data sharing will only take place if it's, if it's transactional. So the goal of Agrimetrics is to establish the infrastructure which will support uh, a, the creation of a data marketplace so that people who provide data can be appropriately rewarded for, for doing so uh, and incentivized to unlock and, and make that data available. So the data marketplace clearly has providers of data and consumers of data. They may be uh, interchangeable, so on occasions some of our data consumers may be providing data into the marketplace as well as as well as consuming it. Now, data marketplace clearly has to have some um, key features. Uh, one of those is that the data needs to be um, usable in different contexts. So when data has been consumed and brought out of the marketplace, it needs to have meaning in the context that it's intended to be used within. And equally, a person who's providing data into the marketplace needs to be reassured that it's only being used in the ways in which the, uh, the provider has intended it to be. So people who are um, uh, providing uh, remuneration to the provider should be the only people that can, can access that data um, uh, in, in the market. So the marketplace at the moment um, exists in a, um, in a number of different forms. In its most primitive form, uh, it looks very traditional. It's how data is being made available uh, in many different, in many different um, um, locations and places. Essentially, data sets are provided in a data catalog uh, so that the person who's searching for data can browse those data sets, uh, get details of how to obtain the data sets, where there's a cost involved, understand what the cost of that, of that data is, and access some, you know, some basic metadata about what's in those, in those data sets. However, as I say, that's a very traditional way of, of making data available and probably not the most valuable in reality, people are likely to want to combine data from a number of different data sets, a number of different sources, depending on the use to which they intend to put that data. So, for example, if you're developing a crop modelling application where you're interested in predicting the yield of a particular crop across a particular geography, you may well want to access soil data, some data about cropping, some data about the agronomy of the crop in the region that you're interested in, the weather data that uh, is relevant to the growth of the crop. And all of those clearly come from different data sets, but you'd like to be able to combine those in, a, in an appropriate way so that you can then do your modeling in, uh, on the basis of a, a data set which is bespoke for that specific purpose. 
So to enable that, what we've done is, is uh, exposed a GraphQL um, uh, API. And in that GraphQL API, what you essentially get is a range of different tree views into the, into the um, uh, more comprehensive knowledge graph, which underlies uh, the marketplace. So the crop modeler would come and access a tree, which is the root of a, of a field. And from that root, the field root, they can then select data that is attributed to that field or links to that field, uh, the soil, the weather, uh, the cropping and the agronomy data. That's uh, a step forward. It gives uh, uh, certainly an enhanced level of, of queryability to the, to the marketplace. But it still isn't as flexible as the underlying knowledge graph potentially um, allows. So in an ideal world, we would want to make available the um, functionality of a Sparkle endpoint to, to consumers of the data. Now, the problem with that is, is well known, is that um, exposing a, a Sparkle endpoint to uh, the general public um, it can lead to uh, complex queries affecting the performance of the um, data infrastructure for other users that are that are um, that are operating it. So we we won't at the moment be making that that functionality uh, directly available, but we will be leveraging it in supporting uh, the creation of. Um, APIs that can be accessed externally. So giving us the ability to rapidly create new APIs that deliver bespoke data sets by using the power of Sparkle as, a, as a, um, um, an underpinning technology in the, in the infrastructure. So I wanted to just um, illustrate a little bit, uh, a little bit of detail what that infrastructure looks like. Uh, and I think the, the key part here is the top half of this diagram. We don't need to really worry about how we're um, um, bringing data into the platform, which is the, the bottom part. So the core of the data platform is the um, other databases. Um, and we use uh, a range of different databases. We have a triple store, but we also use um, Elastic and SQL for um, uh, some, of the, some of the data. And the reason why we do that is for performance reasons, um, because a lot of the data, in particular the time series data that we store in SQL, is um, uh, leaf nodes in the in the graph. Um, we can get much uh, much better performance by storing that data in a SQL database um, rather than putting it all into the all into the triple store. So that means that in serving our um, external APIs or external facing APIs, which are the GraphQL API, which I just referred to, and some uh, uh, also some REST APIs, which we make available. We have the challenge of federating the queries that go to all of these different databases to support that um, as, an internal, as an internal challenge. Now, at the moment, we handle that with a range of internal REST APIs. But what we're uh, in the process of doing now is essentially replacing that um, infrastructure with those APIs with um, a Sparkle um, uh, endpoint. So the Sparkle endpoint will eventually be the federator that um, sends the queries or passes the queries onto the appropriate onto the appropriate data sets in their range of different different stores. So. Um, before handing over to Monica, I just wanted to highlight the ways in which we're using ontologies in, in agrometrics within that, within that infrastructure. So first of all, there is the internal interoperability of data that's essential to, to what we're offering. So in bringing data from different data sets together, we need to have a way of doing that um, efficiently and, and effectively. And so the ontologies bring that capability to that um, to, to, to those data sets. So we can translate concepts from one data set to another to allow, allow us to um, provide these um, bespoke data sets 
which have a, a, a meaningful set of um, reference points, be they the field or the um, cow or, or, or whatever. Um, but in doing that, of course, what we're doing is creating a, a comprehensive annotation of those data sets, which could also be of value to consumers. So a, cons a consumer, a customer who's taking the data from us and wants to make that interoperable with their own internal data um, would value the metadata that we're also ascribing to it for our internal purposes. We're not finding that that's a, a significant demand at the moment, but we do expect it to become so over the course of over the course of time. So at the moment, our priority is not to, to provide um, um, uh, RDF externally, or, um, but we are designing our ontologies internally so that at some point in the future that will happen. So now what I'd like to do is to hand over to Monica who will describe in much more detail the work that we're doing with ontologies. Thanks Richard. So as Richard mentioned, ontologies are the underlying thread that unify the big data sets that we ingest on the Agrometrics platform. Since the data sets we ingest are big data sets, our ontology design principles are governed by those. So as I mentioned, being big data driven implies that the ontology design should be simple to avoid any contradictions and conflicts in the integrated data sets. And data integration is our primary use case. We annotate data using the ontologies we develop because we want to integrate data from multiple sources. Our ontology design is guided by certain relevant, well-designed external models typical to the data set that we are modeling for. And what we do is we map those external URIs to the agrometrics URI. So whenever it's not possible to directly use the types or the concepts underlying an external ontology, we ingest that ontology and we provide mappings to the in-house agrometrics ontology for the same concept. We believe in a lightweight schema design, again, keeping the big data feature in perspective. So what that means is we avoid expressive features of OWL. And a key feature of our ontology design is its alignment with the user-facing APIs, which currently is a GraphQL API. So the idea is that any ontology design we do is uh, done in parallel with the design of the GraphQL schema that will power the API uh, that will expose that particular data set to the end user. So what this means in terms of an ontology development life cycle, so we have data sets from multiple sources. We have uh, competency questions provided by the product manager that guides us towards the ontology design. And then what we also have are domain experts, domain knowledge and external ontologies that all together feed into the ontology design process. But before we actually come to the conceptual model, we have something what we call as the data coverage model. So the data coverage model is an informal representation of how elements in the ontologies are linked together. Once we do that, then a validation process is undertaken with the stakeholders, which are primarily the product uh, manager and the domain experts. Um, the, with the validation of the data coverage model, we then set out to formally serialize the ontology um, in, in the OWL language, uh, which is our syntactic representation of the ontology. And Parallelly, we designed the GraphQL schema, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to be used as the schema uh, for, the, um, for the exposure of the data through our APIs. So really, the design of the ontology and the GraphQL schema happens in parallel so that the um, elements that are exposed to the user through the API really reflect um, what we have designed in the ontology. This gives us two benefits. First of all, the GraphQL API, which primarily, uh, primarily outputs JSON, uh, covers the same uh, conceptual uh, conceptualization 
as the um, as those as land development in geology through the fields that it exposes and it also allows us to expose json ld wherever the user needs it so right now our apis are not content negotiating but when we include that feature uh, you'll be able to get the output as json ld which uh, of course uh, uses the uh, ontological annotations from the ontology and also as a json response from the graphql schema so as richard uh, spoke about the catalog earlier uh, i just want to mention some of the data sources that uh, have been uh, quite uh, paramount in uh, the design of the ontologies that we have done so far so we have ingested uh, data for weather so the historical recent and the forecast uh, data sets for weather uh, for soil we have data sets uh, that uh, talk about its texture the chemistry and the biological parameters we have uh, the nasa solar radiation data we have uh, habitat information from natural england the water water catchment data and for fields we have quite a lot of uh, data sets in the form of boundaries the elevation data uh, the crop attributes for data on the for crops that are grown on the field and the crop types and uh, for livestock uh, we have data coming from a specific project called smart cow where we have uh, data very very specific to cows so given these data sources uh, we have uh, quite a lot of ontology that we have developed over time uh, that we use to annotate these data sets so we have developed uh, an ontology for annotating agricultural plant data for uh, defining the plant growth stages for all aspects of weather the hydrology soil uh, land cover which again talks about the habitat uh, field of course which is a first class citizen um, uh in our api uh, when we expose our data sets uh, through the api uh, the sentinel data attributes that uh, talk about um, various sentinel related data that is recorded uh, the predictive models so we do crop prediction and uh, the data sets that uh, expose those predictions are annotated using this ontology um, the uh the livestock ontologies that are standard such as atoll and eol we provided extensions to them through our ontologies and the key feature about all these ontologies are the spatial and the temporal aspects uh, which we have incorporated in the design so uh, here is a data coverage model and you would see that for key features such as uh, animal observation and uh, milk observation for example Uh, there are certain entities that we would like to incorporate based on the design discussions that have happened with the product manager the stakeholders um and the competency questions that have been developed through those design discussions so this gives you an idea of how a typical data coverage model looks like then following this we develop an ontology and this is for example a soil ontology and you would see that we have things like a soil layer soil texture then we talk about the chemical properties and the biological properties of soil so on and so forth we talk about the domain and range and this uh, diagram shows you uh, an informal representation of the ontology that we then later serialize in owl so um we i was talking earlier about the temporal aspect so the data point ontology covers uh, concepts such as the time stamp the year the month that shows how uh, the temporal information is an integral part of our data sets and how we cover it through the data point ontology and in fact the temporal uh, aspect appears in many such uh, ontologies uh, that we um, that we use so the same conceptualization is then used for annotating data sets where temporal information needs to be exposed the geospatial ontology covers uh, conceptualization such as the polygons the point uh, area where we have to talk about a geospatial shape and we need to represent its uh, uh, its uh, geometry and its centroid for example and the area so there is a good coverage of geospatial conceptualization in the ontology and again this is carried over to the data sets where this geospatial information needs to be exposed uh 
uh, talking about the alignment with GraphQL API. Uh, so coming back to the soil ontology, uh, what you see is the GraphQL interface that is exposing this data to the end user. And you also see the ontological conceptualization. And uh, this really tells you that the design of the ontology and the GraphQL schema is done in, uh, in a way that is aligned uh, so that um, when the user requests data in JSON through the GraphQL API, and when he requests the data as JSON-LD through REST API, the conceptualization that is exposed to him is not very far off. Uh, so they may not, they, they may not be exactly a one-to-one -one mapping between the REST response as JSON-LD and the GraphQL response as JSON, but they are not very far off. So apart from the ontologies, uh, we have certain reference knowledge graphs that we have ingested uh, or, and also developed. So for example, there are certain typical soil texture types that we have uh, materialized as a linked data set. Um, habitat types, water body types, against these are standards used all across the UK um, for describing the water body types. Uh, for crops, we have certain end uses and market options that we have standardized. And as far as external vocabularies and knowledge graphs are concerned, we have incorporated very recently the QUDT reference data set for um, annotating our units and dimensions and quantities. Um, we have mapped these to the existing units and dimensions uh, reference data sets that we have ingested uh, previously. And um, also we now have EPO codes for, uh, for various species and crops and plant types that we have ingested from the, uh, from the EPO data set. So this is really the coverage uh, of uh, ontologies and uh, reference knowledge graphs at uh, Agrimetrics. Uh, the ontology design, as I mentioned before, is uh, very simple, it's lightweight. Its main purpose is to annotate the big data sets that we ingest on our platform and ensure that data set integration is seamless. Um, we uh, express our ontologies in OWL, but we do not really use the very complex and intricate features of OWL. Of OWL, we keep it simple and uh, we expose our uh, ontologies through the JSON-LD response uh, that our REST APIs give. And also some of the conceptualization is exposed as schemas through the GraphQL API that, uh, that outputs JSON. So with that said, uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll be very happy to take any questions uh, from the audience. Thanks once again. Thank you, Richard and Monica for your presentations. We are now at our question and answer session. So if you have questions for the speakers, please write them now in the chat and uh, we'll take them. Hello, everyone. Are we online? Hello, everyone. We are uh, very happy to have you with us today, and we are very excited to have Richard Tiffin and Monica Solenki from Agrimetrics here with us to answer your question live. So if you have questions, please continue at them in the chat and we'll answer them. And we can see uh, that during the presentation, many of you um, asked if we could get concrete example. So now Richard and then Monica will present you some uh, examples. So over, over to you, Richard. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna share my screen, um, which is, um, there we go. And 
think that should allow that to happen. Um, so um, can my colleagues on, Celine, can you see the screen? No. no. Uh, you have to click twice. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Loading. it's loading. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect. So yeah. the first, the first um, thing that we'll show is uh, Field Explorer, which is a um, is based on the linked data that sits in the in the in the infrastructure. But it's a very graphical interface that allows you to access that data. Um, and what we've done is we've associated data uh, from a mem many different sources, weather data, soil data, cropping data, to the um, to each of the fields which we've mapped in 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 the UK. So we can select an area on the map. Uh, in that way and then we can um, search for the fields in that area and we once we've identified the fields we can then go through and select some data that we're interested in for those for those fields so I'm going to select some weather observations and some weather forecasts um, and let's look at the crop that was sown in the field um, maybe um, a little bit of um, environmental data and if we do that search what should be returned um, that is uh, a little disappointing naturally um, uh, it worked two seconds ago <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me do it again. Sorry about this. It's uh, the perils of live demonstration. Maybe I'll tell you what, maybe I've chosen too big an area. Get the area. So, and, um, So you are selecting uh, layers or filters? Yeah, I'm select, yeah, I'm effectively se selecting different, um, different, different data sets, different data from different data sets in this, in this uh, view, uh, and then um, let's. I've chosen too many things here. So while yeah. it's on. So this is crashing. I don't know. Monica, would you like to do your demo and I'll see if I can work out what's going on with this before? Sure. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and uh, because my screen is a little bit away from where I'm sitting, I'm just going to turn my camera off for the minute and I'll do the demo and then um, we'll, we'll come back to my camera. So what I would like to show here is uh, the API interface that we provide for people to explore our integrated data set, which is um, all linked data, of course. Now, exposing Sparkle endpoints to the real world is, um, you know, it, it can lead to several, several performance issues. And um, we all have learned through experience that uh, Sparkle is still quite a steep curve for some people to climb and therefore for the ease of developers which we think is the main market that we um, uh, intend to cover we have a more developer friendly interface to access our data and i'm just going to share my screen in a minute okay uh, can people see my screen we do, Monica. Yeah. Okay. So what you see is uh, what we call a GraphQL Explorer. So our APIs are GraphQL powered in the sense that the schema that we use uh, to um, develop our uh, our API interface is our GraphQL schemas. GraphQL is a standard which is 
very, very, uh, you know, popular in the developer world uh, to, uh, to provide layers uh, for a over APIs. And effectively, the structure that you see here, so for example, let's look at this query, right? So this will allow me to query the underlying data. Uh, and this is actually a query layer on top of our Sparkle endpoints. So we are querying for a field, uh, which is within a specific uh, geographic uh, location. So I'm look, go, looking for a um, field which has a, a centroid at this particular point. And then for this field, what I would like to know is, for example, let's say the crop. So uh, we have got uh, data set IDs as well, because all our data is available through a catalog, which we have. So we have an ID. Uh, now for the crop, we want to know the harvest here as well. So we select the items of interest to us for a field. And uh, then we say go. And what you see on the right hand side is the result that we get for this field. So all the sown crops, the crop type and the harvest year for those crops for this particular field at this particular location. I can ask for other things as well. So for example, for soil, I can ask for the texture, the, uh, the subsoil, the subsoil layer, I can ask the, the clay percentage, the sand percentage, the silk percentage. And then again, I get all of these things. So the idea behind this interface is uh, you can query for what you really need. And uh, instead of using a REST kind of an interface where you get a lot of data and then you have to filter it out yourself, GraphQL provides you with the capability to query for just what you need. Now, the schema that you see here has got more or less a one-to-one -one alignment with the ontologies that we have that are annotating our data sets, uh, which are stored in the triple store. So effectively, it's like a layer over the Sparkle endpoint, uh, but in a much more developer-friendly uh, way uh, that we, we, we provide for people to you know, explore the data we have in one, in one sense and to make it easy for developers to consume our data. We have examples. Uh, we have the schema documented uh, again on this interface. Yes, over here. So, uh, so yeah, so this, uh, this is one way in which we make uh, our data available to developers. Um, so through a GraphQL interface sitting on top of our Sparkle endpoints. Richard, are you ready? Can I pass it back to you? Uh, uh, yes, you can. Um, it's still not 100%. I've been playing with it and it's, um, it's done a, um, it's worked once or twice and it's not worked a couple of times, but I will just quickly try one more time. Um, so okay. we're going to go into Field Explorer and then we select our area that we're interested in again. Which, uh, ah, yes. Uh, I need to, is my screen shared? I have yeah, stopped I... sharing now. Oh, yes. okay. You need yeah. to share your screen. Okay, so that so I've selected an area as I did before, and we click go, and we're able to select some weather and some crop data. That's very okay. So that problem is persisting but I've put one up that is uh, gives you an illustration of some of the data that we've got so we've got a dem um, some earth observation data in there as well as all of that uh, um, terrestrial data and what you see here is the data um, that we've retrieved for a particular field um, we're able to retrieve the leaf area index across the whole of that field and then we can see this is all coming from um, earth observation data we can see how that leaf area index changes through the year. And we can also see the weather conditions um, that are associated with that, with that field as well. So all of that's coming from that, um, from that um, linked data that Monica was showing you. Um, uh, so the same API is driving this as, 
as Monica was showing uh, in her demonstration. Um, okay. Thank you very much for uh, the li live demo, uh, Richard and Monica. So um, another question from the participant is, are your ontologies and knowledge graph are published and are they available? Uh, uh, the not, the, at the moment, they're not published. Um, so some of, uh, some of them will be published. Um, it depends at which level uh, those ontologies have been have been developed. So uh, very specialized and detailed knowledge graphs that are, um, that are or ontologies that have been developed for specific customers, we probably won't make public. But anything that we that we do at a at a much higher level that's necessary for the interpretation of the data that we that we offer, uh, we will be making that that available, um, and we'll make it available in a number of different ways. So one of the things that we didn't show you there was a, a data marketplace sort of visualization, which allows you to access individual data sets as um, separate entities, and so some of those ontologies will be made available. Um, and I believe actually there are some there, there have been some put there in the last few weeks, uh, they will be made available in that in that space. So, so yes, they will be made available um, uh, to a degree. Um, and uh, you can start to see some of that happening now. Yeah, and just to add to Richard's point, uh, some of apart from the ontologies, of course, we have reference data sets, for example, we have ref reference data sets for EPO codes. Um, we looked around for an RDF serialization of the EPO code data that was not available. So now we have done the task of ingesting um, EPO data and uh, serializing it into RDF and making it um, available through the data catalog. So any valid subscriber of a data catalog uh, should be able to see the EPO codes. And uh, going forwards, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of these kind of reference data set ingestion and making them available through the marketplace. So these knowledge graphs, which are standards, um, which are used across the industry, will be made available through the data marketplace, through our data catalog. And Thank also, you very much. Can I ask a question? Yes, Elizabeth. <laughs> Um, I had the question, so if, if the ontologies and knowledge graph are made available, are you planning to contribute to existing ontologies back uh, with your concepts uh, because you developed a, a soil ontology, for example, or you, you've been using uh, ATOL, so are, do you have any plans to also contribute to the public ontologies? Well, actually, um, it's a very good point you mentioned, Elizabeth, about ATOL, because we have already extended ATOL um, with some conceptualizations that we did for the work we did with, within the Smart Cop project. So that is already available, uh, the extended conceptualization in ATOL. But also, very recently, we did some work on extending QUDT, because QUDT is this reference data set stroke vocabulary for um, uh, for units and dimensions and quantity kinds. And there are a lot of units uh, which are not in QDT at the moment, which are very specific to the agri-food sector. So we have introduced those units and we will be writing to QDT with those units so that QDT can make it a part of their wider catalog. So we are enriching the domain knowledge in this sector. Uh, in a very standardized way by contributing to the uh, already open source existing movement in this area. Thank you. Nice. And uh, how can you use ontology design when dealing with real time data? A real time does by real time do you mean streaming data or data which uh, which changes frequently? I would say streaming data. I suppose uh, the question was asked by uh, uh, Natandi, but uh, we cannot give the floor to them. So unless uh, Abdul Shatar Abdullah, you, you want to to precise in the chat, but I would say streaming data. 
uh, streaming data, the, 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 the problem with streaming data is because we don't know the nature of the data, any annotation we use for it has to be uh, coming from a very high level. So we could probably use some upper level ontologies. So the design pattern there would be to use conceptualizations from upper level ontologies to annotate the data which is streaming, the nature of which is unknown, which could be messy, incomplete. But for data which is updated on a frequent basis, so for example, uh, let's take the weather data. Now the weather data, we know that uh, it's updated, let's say three or four times a day. We can learn from the nature of the data and then we can design annotations that fit around it. So we can be more specific about it. Uh, so the ontology design would be governed by what we learn from, you know, uh, what we learn from the nature of the data as we see it frequently for that, for that kind of data. And for streaming data, as I said, it, it has to be more high level. Uh, so upper level ontologies would be driving the, the patterns here. Mm -hmm. And so one of pa participants is interested to know more how you build your ontology. It seems that you've built a simple ontology uh, from the ground. Uh, rather than existing ontologies from other areas. So can you tell more how you, you build your ontology? Oh, well, actually, contrary to, you know, the, uh, contrary, to the point made, contrary to the point made, we actually use a lot of standardized existing ontologies. So we have a lot of DCAT. Uh, in the data catalog, you will see, uh, well, actually the RDF is not yet exposed to users, but eventually you will get a void file. For someone who is interested in knowing the metadata of a data set, there will be a void description available. And there is a lot of DCAT we use in, uh, in the annotations of our catalog. We are using QDT all across the place uh, for uh, identifying units and measures. Now, wherever there is a standardized vocabulary stroke ontology available, we absolutely use it. We are using the, uh, the crop ontology for the genotype and the phenotype information about our crops. So we, we have... Uh, we are using a lot of uh, existing vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we have deliberately kept the design of our ontology simple. There is not a lot of expressivity in it. You won't find existential restrictions, universal quantifications, uh, you know, transitive, symmetric, uh, functional, those kind of assertions in our, uh, in our ontologies. Because the idea is, if you want to integrate data, that is, which is our primary use case. We want to bring in data from multiple places so that you get a more uh, rich set of data for any particular thing in, 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 this, uh, in this space. So when you want to do data, data integration, the smart thing is to keep your vocabulary simple so that downstream, when someone picks up this link data set and integrates it with other data sets they have, there are no inconsistencies, there are no incompatibilities, there are less conflicts to deal with. So it's a deliberate decision to keep the design of the ontology simple. And of course, reuse is, uh, is very important for us. And we definitely, you know, we have, we have always been reusing standardized vocabularies, and we'll continue to do that. Thanks. And so um, many participants are interested to know how to collaborate with you. What, what kind of collaboration are you welcoming? Uh -huh. Do you want to take that? Yeah. We, we're interested in all sorts of collaboration. So we're an organization that, as uh, I said in the presentation, is funded in, in part by the government. Um, we sit between academia, research organizations and the commercial and the commercial sector. And I think that gives a number of different ways in which we can we can interact with people. So firstly, we can be a, a service provider. So um, uh, we we can offer data. Uh, we have academic subscription rates for um, for accessing the platform. Um, we can also collaborate in in research projects. Um, so uh, that could again be uh, an opportunity to access to access data through us, but also to work with you in um, extending our data um, uh, holdings um, and uh, and the data that's made available through the data marketplace. And also to do more fundamental research in, in, you know, in developing the ways in which we structure and organize, organize data. And I think one of the really, really exciting things, so my background is in, in universities. I have a, a, a chair at the University of Reading. One of the very exciting things that, um, 
it being in organizations like agrometrics presents is it, it it removes the cliff edge at the end of research projects so we can start to think about um early on in a research project how that uh, output of that research project and in many cases that could be data but it could be insights models and so on how those can transition into a more commercial setting within the research projects and we're very interested in engaging with 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 um, uh, researchers in delivering that kind of that kind of um, insight as well so 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 if you if you want if you've got thoughts about collaborating if you're interested in what we're what we're doing then please do uh, get in touch with us um, after the after the session, and, and, and you know there there are many opportunities we've met that we can potentially discuss. Perfect, thank you very much, Richard. So we'll be sure to share your your contact in the chat so people can get directly in contact with you. Thank you very much, to Richard and Monica, for your presentation, and thank you all for participating to the session. And we'll make sure to answer your question in the chat for the one that have not been answered uh, during the live question. So this is the end of the session. Please uh, continue exchanging in the chat and now uh, proceed to, to the next session. Thank you very much.